Hello and welcome to the Argus Crude podcast, a weekly podcast where we attempt to shine some light on the workings of the global crude market. I'm Michael Carolan, the editor of Argus Crude here in London, and this week we will be taking a look at the changes seen to global crude trade since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in late February. I'm happy to say that joining me today to discuss the topic is Felix Todd, our senior reporter in London covering the Russian and Caspian crude markets. Welcome, Felix. Thanks, Michael. Happy to be here. It's uh, yeah, it's been a volatile few months, so plenty to go through. Absolutely. Um, as a price reporting agency, we obviously follow the impacts on price very carefully, and the war has had some profound impacts on the on the price of Russian crude as well as of global crude prices in general. But there have also been some large shifts to the flow of crude around the world. Is that right, Felix? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, flows of Russian crude which are typically spearheaded uh, by Urals, the country's medium sour sort of flagship grade. Um, they've shifted dramatically since the conflict started in late February. Uh, this has prompted really all by, by widespread buyer self-sanctioning in Europe, which prompted sellers to target alternative markets. Um, some crudes that can act as Urals alternatives like Yuan Sverdrup from the North Sea have benefited, but others are losing out because Russian crude is pouring into their consumer bases. Um, so, yeah, the situation set to intensify as the year progresses as Moscow's various long-term contracts expire and it has to start placing more and more supply. OK, well, well let's start with Russian crude. Um, how have seaborne flows of Ural's crude in particular changed since, um, since the invasion on 24th of February? Yeah, well, the, the change in Ural's flows um, since the 24th of Feb really reflects a collapse in European demand, particularly from the Baltics, which was historically its, its staple market, really. Um, the Baltics, primarily countries like Finland, Sweden, Poland, uh, they were Ural's top destinations in February, accounting for about a third of the grade's exports, uh, seaborne exports specifically. Another 30% headed for Northwest Europe that month, 15% for the Med, 11% for the Black Sea, and about 8% for Asia. But in March, um, just after the conflict broke out, uh, the dynamic shifted dramatically as Baltic refiners like Neste, Preem, PK and all in all historically staple buyers, uh, as well as some of the larger trading houses that book yields mainly for delivery to Rotterdam, they, they all started backing out spot purchases. So in March, the Med was the yields top destination, accounting for about 30% of seaborne exports. Northwest Europe counted for just 18% rather that month, uh, with Asia, uh, primarily India, receiving about 30% as well. Um, the Baltics and the Black Sea accounted for just 13% combined in March. But then in April, the reliance on the long-haul India market starts to become more apparent. So about 40% of seaborne neurals were shipped east of the Suez Canal that month, with, again, the vast majority heading for India. Um, but about 26% sell for the Med, 8% for the Black Sea, 7% for Northwest Europe, and just over 5% for the Baltics. The residual volumes still sailing for Northwest Europe and the, Balk and the Baltics uh, likely just reflect uh, pre-booked uh, volumes under long-term contracts. Um, most traders and refiners that have stepped away from spot purchases of Urals have, have continued to honour these. Now, that is, of course, an interesting point. There is uh, there's plenty of Russian crude that's still heading for European destinations, despite the self-sanctioning going on in, um, in Europe's refining and trading industry. In the absence of sanctions, long-term contracts have to be honoured after all, but, um, but spot buying of Russian crude has largely disappeared. So what are buyers taking instead of euros? Well, uh, in the Baltics, which by all measures, measures appears to be the, the biggest loss for seaborne euro sellers, Johans Verdrup and Fortis are the obvious choices. They have similar qualities and very similar short-haul freight economics. Um, but elsewhere, the picture gets a little more varied. Um, Spain's Repsol, which is no longer buying spot euros but still receives term volumes, received the cargo of Arab Light from Saudi Arabia in April. Um, Saudi crude, as well as Iraq's Basma, Basra Streams and Kirkuk Blend, are all reasonable alternatives for Mediterranean-based euros buyers. But the Mideast Gulf producers allocate only so much to the West, with Asia being their primary market. Um, somewhere between 5 and 10 million barrels of crude from the UAE is expected to arrive in Europe over May and June on behalf of Total and Repsol. Um, we're hearing from sources. Um, medium sour Mars crude from the US is also a very similar quality crude to Urals, but has only limited volume. Uh, another option for European refiners is blending. So in the past, when the Urals price has been high, some uh, refiners have opted to mix cargoes of a light sweet crude like USWTI with something like Arab medium from Saudi Arabia to essentially yield a synthetic version of Urals. Um, but this is obviously going to be subject to 
very economics and, and a slew of other factors. So by the sounds of it, the European market is presumably one which would welcome the return of Iranian barrels as well, should, uh, should an agreement be reached to bring Iranian crude back to Europe? Yeah, well, I mean, Iranian crude is very similar uh, in quality to euro, so on paper it makes for a good replacement. Um, the EU does seem more upbeat about the prospect of a restored nuclear deal, uh, which could make around 1.3, maybe 1.4 million barrels a day of crude available to Europe again. Uh, but we still have no concrete timeline or any real guarantee that an agreement will be reached. So I don't think it can be counted on as a, as a lifeline at this stage. OK. Now, all of this displaced Euros crude is presumably heading somewhere else. Um, could you tell us where it's going and, and what crudes it's displacing? Yeah, well, I mean, rather counterintuitively, uh, European values uh, differentials for Iraq's Basra streams and Kirkuk blend crude have receded relative to the Atlantic Basin benchmark Sea dated in recent weeks, uh, ostensibly because of the influx of euros in the Baltics. Um, more CPC blend and mainly Kazakh crude exported from Novorossiysk in the Black Sea has been increasingly heading east rather than to its typical Mediterranean client base over the past couple of months as well. And a much, a much larger share of India's demand is being catered to by euros than, than is normal. And uh, this is resulting in a heavily reduced intake of its typical base load West African crudes, although there's been a rise in run rates from India, so that's been mitigated somewhat. Now, I guess it's worth pointing out that, that nothing in the crude market happens in isolation. Um, for example, the fact that crudes such as 40s and Johann Sverdrup are, are staying in Europe – rather than heading to their usual customers in Asia Pacific. That is, of course, partly driven by European demand for North Sea crudes as a, a replacement for Yosh, Russian Euro, Euros. But it is perhaps driven just as much by a collapse in demand in China as it locks down cities mm. to combat the, the latest wave of COVID-19 infections. Um, that said, there is little doubt that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is, is likely to have a profound long-term impact on global crude flows, whatever happens in China. So um, from your perspective, what, what does the future look like for Russian crude? Yeah, difficult to say. Uh, the, the vast array of EU sanctions against Russia, they all sort of came into effect yesterday on the 15th of May. Uh, but their impact can really be traced back to the start of March when, as we were discussing before, most of the key buyers in the Baltics and Northwest Europe started self-sanctioning. That was what prompted the redirection in flows. Um, an outright embargo by the EU on Russian crude exports into Europe, that remains blocked primarily by Hungary, which is obviously heavily dependent on the volumes it receives from the Drisba pipeline. Um, I, I think the key trend now will be monitoring how Russia relocates its volumes currently being placed into long-term contracts with companies like PKN, Orlin, uh, Trafigura, Repsol, Nesta, Glencore, etc. Uh, Rosneft's latest six-month tender came to an end in March, and it reportedly received no bids for its renewed offer for volumes to be loaded over April to September. Um, the term volumes, um, they typically account for about two-thirds of seaborne New York's exports. So while Moscow might be able to find new homes for the cargoes typically sold on the spot market, the remaining supply might prove a bit more tricky to relocate purely because of how much there is. Um, Russia cut its production by about 870,000 barrels a day to just 9.13 million barrels a day last month, which was the lowest in about 16 months. But it is highly likely it'll be forced to wind down much more as these, these pre-booked term contracts expire over the course of this year and next. Uh, the IEA is uh, initially estimated as much as 3 million barrels a day could be shut in from May onwards, though it's since revised this number. Now it expects a, a 600,000 barrels a day drop in Russian output. Uh, this month, with that decline forecast to extend to maybe 2 million barrels a day in June, possibly even 3 million barrels a day from July. A significant uptick in Chinese buying could plug at least some of the gap. Uh, we haven't seen yet, that yet, though, because, as you mentioned, the extensive lockdowns in the country appear to have curbed any demand or any increased demand for euros, uh, despite its record deep discounts. Great. I mean, it, it's obviously foolish to try and predict the future, especially in the crude market. But we can perhaps see a world where Russian crude travels largely to Asia Pacific, leaving European buyers to absorb the North Sea and Mediterranean life sweet grades while importing their sour crude from Asia Pacific. That's maybe not the most efficient way to run a global commodities market, mm. but it may have the effect of cutting off Russia's oil revenues. A, a, a limited number of buyers for Russian crude should ensure that Russian barrels trade at a significant discount to equivalent mm. grades mm. from elsewhere, which has been happening already. And cutting the funds for Putin's war is presumably the whole point of the sanctions and the, and the self-sanctions. So I mean, either way, it should be a, an interesting few months ahead following this particular market. Absolutely. We'll be monitoring it closely.
Okay. Well, thank you, Felix, for joining us today. I'm sure we will have you back on the podcast soon as this situation continues to develop. Thanks very much. My pleasure. And until then, the insights of Felix can be found on a variety of Argus publications, including but not limited to Argus Crude, Argus Global Markets, and of course, our Russia focus, FSU Energy. So um, thanks very much for listening and, and goodbye. Mm-hmm.